Hello everybody, welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope you're doing well. And today we'll be doing our top 10 best movies of 2022. 2022 was a pretty much average year when it comes to films. There were some really good films, there were some really bad films, and there were a ton of average films. That seems to be kind of the, the standard of what uh, modern filmmaking is, is that usually the standard is just mediocre to, to bad films, but there are some that are able to creep through. There are some that are actually able to be uh, pretty good in the process, and so I have narrowed down my list to top 10, and then I also have some honorable mentions, as I like to always have every single year, of films that I really, really liked, but didn't necessarily want to put onto my top 10. 10 list for, you know, various reasons. Also, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that there are, of course, several films of 2022 that I was not able to go see. Um, and so, therefore, if you see a film or there's not a film on the list, uh, that very well could be the reason why, or could also mean that I just didn't like the film. Uh, so, be make sure to stay tuned for my uh, top 10 worst films of 2022, which I'm sure will cause a stir, just like uh, it tends to on the channel. Uh, before we do the further, though, please make sure you smash that like button, not that fire button if you're watching it, honestly, and smash the rumble button as well. And also, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel with the bell notification on that way you know every video or live stream goes live on the channel. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about the best film. Of 2022. Of course, this is featuring the image that I've been using for the Wednesday Raven Awards. So, this year, Raven Awards is our Oscars boycott. If you want to be able to participate and vote for the best and worst of films in 2022, make sure to check out the link in the pinned comment below. And also, of course, let me know your own top 10 films of the year as well. So, first, let's go ahead and get started with some honorable mentions, all right, with this beautiful PowerPoint presentation that I have put together. So these are the films, again, that I liked, but not nearly enough to be able to actually put onto my list. For those that are, are wondering what I do sometimes is I, I put lists together by uh, using a formula, and using this formula, I'm able to get a numerical value for how much I like to film. I break it down into objective categories and subjective categories, and so uh, because of that, it gives me a little bit of a better idea to kind of you know get my mind in order and it helps me make decisions. Some films end up getting the same score, and so that makes it where, okay, which one do I think is more rewatchable, tends to be the tiebreaker for most of those, and there are several in my top 10 list that actually ended up getting uh, a tied uh, score, and I'll talk about those when I get to them. But let's first talk about some of the films that, again, were really, really good, but not necessarily enough to make it onto my list. So the first one is The Black Phone. This is a really, really good film. Very much surprised me. Ethan Hawke did a great job in this film. And uh, I would say if you are a fan of thrillers, if you are a fan uh, of some of the more, you know, darker, really, you know, I guess you could say it is a type of horror film, but it's a lot more of a, of a thriller, which is why I very much like it. This film was just so close to getting it onto my top 10 list, but didn't quite make it, but definitely a fantastic film that I would highly recommend everyone go see. Also, RRR was also a very good film. I'm sure this is going to make it onto a lot of people's top 10 list this year. For me, it just, uh, there was just something about the film, the way that it was actually shot uh, with the, it just seemed like the voices were added on after the fact. It seemed like the voices were ADR'd most of the time, like the actors came in after the fact and recorded them in studio. And again, this was using the the actual, just the regular native language that was, you know, for the film, because obviously when it comes to foreign language films, you can get the dubbed version, you can get the subtitled version, but even using the subtitled version of this movie, I don't know, there was something just really, really off about it, and that was something that was very hard to ignore, but the film, still nonetheless, is very, very fun, and definitely one of the best films to come out in 2022. Father Stu, this is a film also that was really early on, like, on my radar, I was like, yeah, this might be a top 10 list contender, because I just really thought the story was very well constructed, just the fact that it's a story about a man who starts off as a criminal, starts off as, as you know, as many people know, I'm a devout Catholic, so he starts off as a sinner and then becomes a priest, and just to see his uh, transition from one to the other, I thought was really, really compelling, and Mark Wahlberg, uh, you know, was a, you know, really heavy force behind this film, this movie was a passion project that he really wanted to make, and I thought that it ultimately was a very, very good film, and uh, again, kudos to them for being able to pull it off. Another film that was also very enjoyable to watch this year was Weird, the Al Yankovic story. A very underrated film this year. I think the biggest issue with the film, of course, is that it's a Roku original, and it's only available on Roku. And I think that that probably is ultimately what, what really hurt this movie, because unless you have a Roku device, or have the Roku channel, or, or have access to other means, it's very hard to watch this movie, right? So all the other films you can either watch because they're on a, a much larger platform, something like Netflix, or because they have a theatrical release and get a physical media release. When it comes to this film... It's basically you got one or the other, and it's again, it's sad that it's kind of stuck behind the the Roku experience because the film is really, really fun. It makes fun of the uh, the based on real life, the biopic, uh, you know, musical uh, films in a very, very clever way. And uh, yeah, shout out to Weird, the Algon Giving Story, very, very solid film there. Also, the last two I have on my list of honorable mentions are both horror films. I'm not a big fan of horror in general, so that's why these are my honorable mentions because even though. 
I did enjoy them for what they were and respected it from what they were and thought that they did very good as far as just, again, being within the horror franchise and not falling into necessarily some of those, uh, you know, the usual conventions and at least having something interestingly interesting enough in their plot to keep me intrigued because normally when it comes to horror films, I just shut off because I just don't like entertaining horror ideas. Uh, Barbarian is one of those movies, though, that did a really good job of just being able to create something very unique, right? The whole experience of going to an Airbnb turned into a horror film. Uh, uh, very, very clever, and I thought very, very well done. And that also goes the same with Smile as well. I thought the marketing campaign for this movie was fantastic. And uh, because of the positive word of mouth of this movie, I actually went up and actually eventually went to go see it. And yeah, it creeped me the heck out. And uh, so that's why it ends up on my top 10 list, or rather my honorable mentions list in my top 10 of the year. But let's go ahead and let's officially dive into the top 10 movies of 2022. And so they, these are indeed in order. And so these are, again, the films that I was able to officially score. And so the lowest of the scoring, but still a very good film, the top 10 uh, film, right? So number 10 is going to be What is a Woman? So this is a film from The Daily Wire. It's a documentary. It's one of the few times that a documentary ever makes it onto my top 10 list. And uh, again, the reason why this movie made it over those other films that I've mentioned is because I think this film might be one of the most important movies to come out, uh, not just this past year, but also um, really over the last 10 years, right? It's, it's dealing with an issue, uh, right? There's the questions of identity. There's the questions of the things that our, our youth are going through as far as identity crisis. And it, again, asks a very simple question. How do we define what it means to be a man or a woman in society and in culture? And then also, why is it that we're seeing this separation within this academic sphere between, right, uh, what you are, you know, uh, the, the, the biological sex that you have versus, you know, so-called gender identity. And I thought it did a very, very good job of really being able to show uh, kind of just, again, the, the really, you know, uh, just nastiness of of the culture that is really pushing these gender identities onto a lot of these kids. And it's just, again, a very eye-opening experience. I think that this is a film that everyone should watch, regardless of your political ideology, uh, because I think it's just very effective. And I think it's very, very important for our times for people to really understand this <clears throat> within the full context of everything going on. So that's my number 10 film. Coming in at number nine is The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. So this is a movie I actually just rewatched with my wife. And when I first saw this movie in theaters, I actually, you know, I enjoyed it. I thought it was, I thought it was a fun time, you know, is exactly what I expected from a Nick Cage movie that's featuring Nick Cage playing Nick Cage. But I, uh, again, when I, when I came out of it the first time, I thought it was okay. I thought it was fine. The thing that put this onto my list though was watching it a second time because one, it held up very well. And second, the chemistry between Nick Cage and Pedro Pascal is so good. And I had forgotten how much I enjoyed the relationship between those two characters that it just automatically made me go okay this this movie is absolutely one of my favorite films to come out this past year because even though Pedro Pascal can be a bit of a, a tool in real life when it comes to his on-screen presence and his on-screen persona he actually again is he makes a very likable character and this is something that I think a lot of people have been seeing in a lot of the past several uh, roles that he's played but I think no no better example is there in the unbearable weight of massive talent which also of course includes an incredible performance from Nick Cage coming in at number eight is Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. So that's right, an animated film made it onto my list. This movie, you know, this this movie it took so many days. Uh, I want to say it took like the better part of, of a year or more to actually make the movie because it was stop motion animation. Uh, it's very rare that you see those stop motion films being made in Hollywood. And I think Guillermo del Toro, like, of course, putting out a Pinocchio film the same year that Disney is putting out another Pinocchio film, which ends up being, you know, one of the worst films to come out. And that's a film that I just refuse to see because of how bad I heard it is. And I don't go my, out of my way to see bad films. When I heard about this movie, though, I had my doubts because I'm not the biggest Guillermo del Toro uh, fan. However, when I heard that it was very good, when I heard that um, it was a very realistic take on on the original story, I said to myself, okay, well, you know what? I've actually never read or read anything about the original story before. I've, all I've ever known is the classic Disney animation. So going into this, I was just very surprised. I was like, I did not know this about the original story. I didn't know about all these different uh, aspects and all of these different uh, story elements that are just completely ignored altogether by the Disney version. And also just what it tells us about the value of life, right? What does it mean to to live? Um, what does that look like? And then also there's a very interesting uh, dynamic going on behind the scenes because you also have uh, the main the main character of Geppetto um, living in a town where he's uh, at first, right? When when he is before he is struck with tragedy, right? With with his losing a child, he is working uh, in a Catholic church and, and, and building a crucifix. And I was just very compelled. I, I just I thought it was very compelling to see that 
background, you know, Catholic imagery going on there uh, with the church, but then also dealing with, you know, the loss of a child and also the way that we are able to, you know, to be able to deal with that. So I thought at the end, beautiful animation and beautiful storytelling. The music isn't all that great. I thought that some of the, you know, some of the songs in the film I could have done without. It's not heavy on the songs, but that was really kind of like the only bad part of the film necessarily, but a very strong movie nonetheless, and definitely one of the best films to come out in 2022. All right, coming in at number seven is The Outfit. This is a film that was sent to me by Laura, the modern major general story, so shout out to you, and thank you very much for sending me this movie. Mark Rylance gives an incredible performance in this film. It continues to be that very understated persona, right? If you've ever seen a Mark Rylance movie, uh, the other one that people may have seen was Bridge of Spies, where he I believe he won an Oscar for that one. Um, but here he plays a, a tailor right he plays someone who who makes suits a craftsman and it's just very compelling even from the very get-go when all you get is a a voiceover by Mark Rylance all talking just talking about how to you know make a suit and the stitches while watching someone actually you know making a suit in the process of it was so just it's one of those things that you could just like fall asleep to honestly right it's just so calming and it's just so collected but and then you have like again that calming side of it and then you have the story that then unfolds after the fact you find out more about his character you find out about the world that he lives in and it's just a very interesting story that has a lot of really good layers to it. And so that's why I would definitely recommend this movie as one of the best films to come out in 2022. And again, shout out to Laura for sending me that um, on Blu-ray because again, it was just very, very, uh, it was very fun. The entire experience was a fun time. And I think that most people would probably find themselves enjoying it, especially for that Mark Rylance performance. Coming in at number six, this is a film I guarantee that people probably have not seen. And it's a film from Ron Howard, so a pretty big name in Hollywood, but it was delegated to an Amazon Prime release. And I think because of that, no one saw it, no one heard about it, and that's 13 Lives. This is a movie that is honestly one of the best films to come out this year. Uh, I mean, it, it stars Viggo Mortensen in the film. It deals with an actual real-life story, right, of, about a group of, you know, a soccer team getting uh, trapped in a cave when, when there's this massive flood going on, and it, it talks about how there are these divers, right, the scuba divers who are trying to get in to try to help the get, get the kids out, and all of the things that they have to go through, right, all of the, the obstacles they have to go through, it just has so much tension and has so much like on the edge of your seat. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what they're going to do. Wait, that's their plan. That's insane. And then to see it all play out and to see all again, the, the things that can go wrong along the way. It has so much tension. You feel like you're holding your breath every single time they are under the water. Uh, so again, kudos to um, Ron Howard and kudos to the entire team behind this movie because what they were able to do with these underwater shots, having the actual actors themselves, right, being featured in them, uh, showing them under the water, some of the, obviously, the professional scuba divers that were going to be a part of these shots too. Kudos to them because it's always great to see films like this. They use those practical effects and don't use CGI. And uh, it was just really awesome to see. So if you are a big fan of of like actually good biopics, um, not necessarily biopics, but based on re real life, based on true life events, and you're a big fan of Viggo Morrison, or you're just a big fan of like films that have you on like the edge of your seat, you don't know what's gonna happen next because of it, the fact that it is real, it's something that is based on reality, I would highly recommend this movie. Um, it sucks that it's on Amazon Prime, and there's no physical media release at this point. I really hope they do put it on physical media because I would love to see some of the behind the scenes on Blu-ray or on 4K even. Um, but definitely a good film that I would recommend, probably more so than any of the other films that are going to make it onto my top five because I just, again, no one has seen this movie. And so that's why I'm going to speak about this. Again, just so very close to getting into my, my top five. Uh, this actually tied with my number five movie. And the only reason why I put the number five movie over this one is because I think the number five film is just a bit more rewatchable. But 13 Lives still a fantastic film nonetheless and I just wanted to make that clear because of how underrated I think the film is and again no one actually went to go see it it didn't get really any uh you know uh, attention from from critics or from anybody really and it's really sad because it is freaking awesome all right now we're getting into my top five films of the year so these are where we start to see some uh, again some similarities as far as the scoring are concerned so bullet train uh is going to be my top five movie i think this is no one's surprise right the number five movie of the year for me is bullet train this movie i had so much fun with there's a great uh just undercurrent of a theme in the film dealing with thomas the train where if you've seen the movie you know what i'm talking about and i think it's done so cleverly and so hilariously that it is probably one of my favorite aspects of the actual movie itself because the story, even though it is, again, pretty much a by the numbers story, like when you like, you know, pull back some of the layers because of like the nuances, because of the new things that are added in, because of like the unique things to this movie that are added in. It makes it just so much fun to be able to experience it. Brad Pitt, of course, uh, you know, love him or hate him. 
I thought he did a very did a very good job of this guy who is essentially uh, you know a hitman type persona, but with a heart of gold who who tends to just luck his way into everything, and they really just he, you know heavily lay into that aspect of him just being very very lucky, and I, I think that it's just done so cleverly and just so uh, so well that it's just an enjoyable experience. This is a film that I know that I'll continue to go back to because of much how much fun it is, and that's the reason why I put this over thirteen lives because of just again how much fun it actually is. But this actually got the same score as uh, 13 Lives, as, as, as actually did The Outfit 2, because all those films were very, very, very high on my list. Coming in at the number four movie of the year for me is a film that I really, really enjoyed a lot, and I knew that it was going to make it into my top list somewhere, um, and, I, and I expected it to probably be in my top five, but there were other films that came out that actually surprised me more and ended up actually booting this film out of my even top three picks, but my number four film of the year is Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. This movie is just so much fun. Uh, it features an incredible performance from from Ki Hui Hyung. I, again, I, I probably very much uh, mispronouncing his name, uh, but many people know him as Data from the Goonies, um, or or from his from his role in in uh, the <laughs> in the Indiana Jones and uh, the Temple of Doom film. Uh, so it's again great performance from him, great performance as well. Uh, again from everyone else in in the film. It's just you know Michelle Yeoh especially. It's just a very <laughs> clever film. I know River. I know. I know she was really hoping this film would make it on into the top three, but it just really is probably the the best multiverse film that we've ever gotten. Uh, when this film came out, this was still within the year of Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness, and so that was the other multiverse movie, which was terrible. This movie, on the other hand, was able to take the concept of a multiverse, have fun with it, right? Have fun with it so that you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to see next. I don't know what exactly is going to happen, and it's just, again, a very fun, very unique, very original story to boot, but ultimately comes down to a relationship between a mother and daughter and ultimately comes down to the relationship also between husband and wife as well and I thought that it was very very compelling because of that has this heart behind the story that really does drive it forward and uh, again is enough fun uh, with all the multiverse stuff as well to really keep you invested in the film so my number four film is everything everywhere all at once all right so now we're in the top three movies of the year and so coming in at number three these all by the way all my top three films received the same exact score. So these actually received a 98 out of 100 for me uh, based on the score and based on the things that I that I put these at. So I put these in order of what I think is the rewatchability factor, basically. So my top three films of the year, starting off with The Banshees of Anishirin. So this was a surprise for me because the first time I saw this film, I fell asleep. First time I saw this film, I saw it late at night, and that was a bad decision on my part, and I should have known better because I've, I'm notorious for when I go to see later films, uh, falling asleep, even if it's a film that I actually genuinely like. Uh, the other film that I think is compar comparable to this one because of it being not an action-heavy film, um, and so one that therefore might not be able to keep a the attention of people as much, is a Mario Scorsese film called Silence, which I saw, again, another late night showing of and fell asleep with that one. That also ended up being one of my favorite films of the year that that film came out, uh, because when I rewatched it, and I actually watched it at a time when I knew that I would be better disposed to watch it, I loved it. And same thing goes with The Banshees of Nishrin. This film is just, again, fantastic. It's from Martin McDonough, who has done so many great films. The fact that they were able to get Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson back on screen. This is the same trio, really, with the director included, um, that did In Bruges, which is one of my favorite dark comedies of, of all time. This one is not a dark comedy. I think that that's something that some people might um, have to be prepared for when watching the film. It is a drama with dark comedic elements, whereas In Bruges is just a straight-up dark comedy with, with again, some, some of those dark dramatic elements. But this film is a very well-written drama, deals with someone who one day says, you know what, I don't really want to be friends with you anymore. I want to actually do something with my life. And I feel that the conversations I'm having with you are waste of time all of this set with the backdrop of the civil war going on in in ireland right it's just uh again with with things happening off the coast of this uh again this made-up island um you know made up for the film basically and i thought it was a very compelling just uh comparison a very compelling story right not only about friendship but also about just humanity itself and also the the cost of war the cost of war not just amongst nations or within nations but also the cost of war between friends as well and it's just again a very very well done story with fantastic acting it has pretty much made it all the things that are needed for me to like a movie having it said in ireland definitely also helps with that having colin farrell give a very great under you know very uh you know, subtle performance as well, and just to be able to hear his, you know, his his natural Irish accent as well is also just very great to see. So kudos to the entire team. Banshee and Nishirin, one of the best films of uh, of the year in my top three. Coming in at number two, this is a movie that I'm going to be honest, almost took the top spot. 
And I was very surprised because when I was putting my rankings together, I was putting my ratings together, I was very surprised to see how high this film scored, right? When I when I stepped back and said, no, actually, all of these objective elements are there, and subjectively, I also just really enjoyed it, and I had so much fun with it. And so I got to give kudos especially to this movie because I it was a movie that I wanted to see. It was a movie I heard some good things about, but I did not expect to enjoy the film as much as I did, and a lot of it comes down to the story. So my number two film of the year is The Menu. This movie is just so good. I, I mean, the story itself, just like a full course dinner, as the entire film is set up to be, right? So, you know, some films, they set up themselves up as chapters. This one sets itself up as a full course uh, dinner. So every single uh, sequence of events that happens has a title to it. And it's a, again, seen as course one, course two, course three, and it has a different title to it. And all of the titles have something to do with what's going to happen within that sequence of events. So this film is just fantastic. Ray Fiennes, to me, gives an incredible performance here. Uh, just, again, uh, playing the chef in the movie. He does a great job. He just commands the the screen whenever he is there. He commands his, you know, he has the, that commanding presence uh, that this character obviously should have. You also have amazing supporting uh, roles and, and supporting actors that are that are giving a lot to this movie as well. Uh, you have Nicholas Holt, who does a great job playing this, this foodie, Right, there's this guy who's obsessed with food and obsessed with the chef and everything, and he just again just plays that character very, very well. And then of course you have also Anya Taylor Joy, who's one of my favorite actresses working right now in Hollywood, who also just gives a very, you know, as usual, gives a solid performance. But really, Ray Fiennes is the reason why this movie works so well. Um, again, is it is it a perfect story? Not necessarily. I think that there's a lot more they could have done to. I, I, I would have been more interested to find out more about like this cult like staff that he has. Right, not a whole lot of information is given on them. That's the only reason why. I would think that, you know, it didn't make it into my top spot. Also, the fact that it's not as rewatchable as my top film of the year. But still, the menu is still so freaking good. And if you've not seen the film... I highly recommend it. Um, again, it is a it's a it's a thriller. It is a, a mystery, and it's definitely one of the best mysteries of the year. Hell, a lot better than Glass Onion. And it's again fun to boot with the performances and with the elements of the story. Has a lot to say about critics too. And I thought that the commentary on critics was actually very much on point. Right, critics are very good at being able to try to poke holes in everything. But when it comes to actually creating something, then it's an entirely different story. And I thought that that dynamic was also very very compelling to watch as well. And now my number one movie of the film of, of the film of the year. My number one film of the year. This should be no surprise to anyone who knows me, who's been seeing me, uh, who's, who's heard me talk on this channel at all. My number one film of the year is Top Gun Maverick. This movie, just from the first time I watched it, I was in love with it. Uh, I remember that this film had been my most anticipated film for a good two, three years because of the pandemic. It kept getting pushed back, and every time there would be an announcement in the news about this movie getting pushed back another six months or so, I was so upset because I was just thinking to myself, I really want to see this movie. I want to see the technology that they were able to put into these planes. I want to see the actors themselves experiencing real G-forces and looking at the behind the scenes especially of the movie made me appreciate that much more because every actor who was ever, you know, filmed in the cockpits of these actual real fighter jets, um, all of them had to play not only the, the the role of an actor, but all of them also had to play the role of cinematographer, had to play the role of gaffer. Like, they had to actually know something about lighting, know something about uh, how to frame a shot, because they were the ones in control, because they're the ones obviously dealing with the cameras that they were able to retrofit to fit into these, uh, these fighter jets, these real fighter jets, um, and uh, they had to be able to figure these things out. So that alone, right, in addition to the story just being uh, fun to boot, right? It is essentially a retelling of the original story, right? It's a, almost a beat for beat um, in various ways and various aspects, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, very, very variable of the original story. So that's why it's not the most original story out there. But I think that what it does is it takes it from the beginning and has it be, okay, let's go ahead and start things off very similar, right? Very comfortable. But then as the film goes on, it starts to go in some different directions, right? There's again, some of the, some of the similar beats, like with the love story and, and all the different elements that that love story might have. But but I think that it is able to build enough, especially with the relationship between uh, Tom Cruise's character of Maverick and then also the character of Rooster played by Miles Teller, right? The son of Goose. I thought that that relationship, too, was really, really compelling. Miles Teller gives an, a fantastic performance in this film. And I think Tom Cruise also probably gives one of the best performances of his career, which is weird, right? Top Gun Maverick, you wouldn't think acting performances of the year, but Miles Teller gives it in this movie. Tom Cruise gives it in this movie. I mean, again, as far as the actual emotional weight of the scenes, it's fantastic. The scene, my favorite scene probably with Maverick is probably the film, is probably the scene that has him with Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer, to me, is one that's not being talked about enough with this movie. Even though he's with, he's only in the film for like a little while, the scene that he is in and the performance that he gives 
is just so powerful. It's so well done. And so again, kudos to everyone involved. Joseph Kosinski, who was the director of this film, and everyone else involved, and obviously Tom Cruise for being able to put all this together to be crazy enough to do these things and also to be able to convince these other actors to actually get into these fighter jets to do the things that they are doing. So best film of the year, hands down. It's not just a good film. It's also a film that's so darn entertaining and a film that I know that I'm going to continue to rewatch every single year, probably uh, for this foreseeable future. But these are my top 10 movies of the year. What are your top 10 films? Let me know in the comment section down below. If you agree with my list or you disagree with my list, let me know that as well. Anyway, that's going to be it for me today. I'm going to, of course, have my top 10 worst films with my dishonorable mentions coming out at some point in the future. Also, I'm going to have my breakdown of the biggest winners and losers as far as studios of the box office are concerned. Concerned. And so be on the lookout for those films and also my most anticipated films of 2023. All of these are lists that I'm putting together uh, at the same time. And so expect those uh, again at different days of the week uh, going forward. And uh, again, thank you very much for for watching this video. If you like this video, smash that like button, like that fire button, honestly, smash the rumble button. You're all amazing and beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, God bless. And now for a huge shout out to all of my January Patreon subscribe star and locals members at the Keeper of the Bifrost level and above. Starting off with my Patreon members, Father Luca Illick, Garrett Searles, Jaime Ivy Hymason, Joe Horn, Jonathan Carney, Orange Chat Reviews, who can check out on his YouTube channel, Orange Chat Reviews, Rosetta Allen, who you can check out at her YouTube channel, Eagle Rider, and Miss Martin Muses, who you can check out at her YouTube channel, Miss Martin Muses, and of course, the amazing Empress of the Universe, Tina B, who you can check out over on her YouTube channel, Tina B, with her show Soup to Nuts, which she does, um, tries, to do, tries to do every single week with her friend and with fellow uh, Valkyrie and fellow mod of the channel. Stephanie B. And also a special shout out to the Modern Major General of the channel, Laura Story. Thank you again for joining. And of course, I do want to give a special shout out to Tina B and make sure that everyone knows that our prayers are being extended towards her as she continues to recover from complications that have occurred uh, recently with her medically and has resulted in a loss of eyesight or at the very least of, of more clear eyesight. So to continue to offer our prayers for her. Also, a shout out to my subscribe star peeps, Matt317, who can check out on his Twitch channel by the same name, The R, Fast Reaction, Mr. Roy, J-Rod, The Beer Guru, and The K-Man, who can check out over at xthebounderies.co. And last to my locals members, Miss Minnesota Hockey Fan, How About a Hockey Player, J.H. Schwalbach, Brett D90, and the amazing lawyer Brett, oh, sorry, and the amazing lawyer Robert Barnes. So thank you all very much for supporting me on Local Subscribe Star and Patreon. If you want your name shout out at the end of every live stream and video, please check out the top link in the video description below where you get access to this and also, of course, to a monthly podcast that I do with John the Flick Flick Plickinger. Also access to a giveaways channel on my Discord where I give away films this month. I've got films like Seven Samurai on Blu-ray from the Criterion Collection to give away The Banshees of Anishirin, Tommy Boy Steelbook, Edge of Tomorrow 4K, and tons of other 4Ks and Steelbooks as they get released over the next month will be available. And also, of course, digital codes as well so if that any of that sounds interesting to you check out that top link and join over on patreon subscribe star or on locals you guys are all amazing and beautiful people hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and as always god bless